Um, I'm, my name is Jendi. I'm the <coughs> lead for this meeting. Uh, I just give you some brief introduction of IRPIC and uh, physical oceanography team. So uh, for those of you who don't know that IRPIC is the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee. It brings together leaders from 18 agencies, departments, and offices across the U US federal government to enhance collaboration on research in the Arctic. IRPIC collaboration is a public branch of IRPIC. It aims to facilitate interagency communication, coordination, and collaboration to advance Arctic science. IRPIC recently released its Arctic Research Plan 2022 to 2026, the first biannual implementation plan launch workshop was recently held at the end of January. Physical oceanography team is known as, now known as um, Physical Oceanography Community of Practice. Our team aims to coordinate research of the physical oceanography of the Arctic Ocean. Today, we'll be talking about the blue economy in Alaska. The ocean economy, also known as the blue economy, plays a pivotal part in Alaska's economy as well as the entire nation. Recently, the Arctic has experienced rapid environmental changes, uh, <clears throat> such as decline of sea ice content and increase of ocean <clears throat> acidification, which could impact Alaska's blue economy. The effort to build Alaska's blue economy include uh, mariculture uh, using marine microalgae to produce biofuels. In this session, two experts will present perspectives on Alaska's blue economy and microalgae research inspiring novel energy resources uh, marina program. We are very lucky to have invited two very distinguished scientists to give presentation. Um, at the very last minute, we switch the um, sequence of presentation. Now we have our first speaker is going to be Michael Stackel, uh, professor of University of Alaska Southeast. He will talk about marine culture of uh, sugar kelp as a scalable model for offshore cultivation. The second speaker is Justin Stenberg from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and he is the director of Alaska Blue Economy Center. He will talk about the applied blue economy, developing industry and community engagement in Alaska. Now let's uh, welcome our first speaker, Professor Michael Stecko. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so I am an actual professor emeritus at the University of Alaska and I'm now associated with Fairbanks, not Southeast, but it's in the same place, still in Juneau. So I'll share my screen here. Um, okay. Well, it was working before, wasn't it? There we go. Okay. So as mentioned, I'm going to talk about our work that we've done in uh, Alaska on the miracles of sugar kelp. Uh, and the vision basically is to develop a replicable farm system for seaweed production that when combined with innovative seed planting and harvesting technologies results in affordable biomass production. So the goal here with RPE funding is to, is to look at the feasibility of large scale seaweed culture that might be used for biofuel or used in some energy capacity. This project is, uh, has a lot of team, a lot of people on our team, sorry. Uh, aside from myself, there's uh, Charlie Yersh's group in the University of Connecticut, uh, Scott Lindell's group from Huey, uh, Kendall Barberry from Green Wave, uh, Cliff Gowdy is our, our engineers, uh, Julie Decker from Alaska Fisheries Development Foundation, Toby Dewhurst for Kelsey Marine, Bo Perry Blue Evolution, who's our, our private uh, partner, business, sorry, industry partner, and Loretta Robertson from Marine Biological Lab. And of course, a lot of other people that we hire. And our, the main people here are Nick Mancini, who's the, our seaweed person who grows seaweed on, in Kodiak, and also Alf Pryor, also a seaweed farmer in Kodiak. 
without who without who helped these two people, uh, these two people, nothing would happen. So uh, first, I want to talk about uh, the let's have to move some stuff out of the way so I can see myself. Uh, the process of of growing seaweeds, at least these kelps here. So first, we find uh, a fertile plant in the field that has a fertile area called a saurus. We release spores from this. The spores look kind of like this. They swim around and they settle out and then grow into an alternate uh, one in gametophyte phase where there's females and males. <laughs> and under certain conditions, uh, they'll become fertile, making this is an example of a female egg. Sperm and uh, will grow into little baby plants. In the actual uh, hatchery itself, or so called hatchery, we take from the spores and we settle them on uh, string that are wrapped around these spools in, in uh, tanks. We give them nutrients, we let them uh, grow for six or seven weeks uh, until they look like this on the string. So these are baby plants now, and now these are sporophytes. Uh, we take these out to the field in the, in the cylinders, wrap them around string. And the out, these, are, these are long line out plantings, and we put these in a structure similar to this, where the plants are going to be growing, hanging about three meters under the surface. And then we finally get the product. These are outplanted in the fall, usually around November, and they're harvested in usually May or June. This area here is what we call the hatchery. It's one of the things that we try to improve the process. So this is our, our hatchery improvement process. Um, so conventional, which I just mentioned, we seed strings with spore solutions and we incubate them for five to seven weeks in culture and hatchery in modified medium. Uh, direct seeding is a new innovation that's being applied by a lot of different people now, and we're trying it here in Alaska, was seeding ropes directly with gametophytes or with baby sporophytes. And basically, this would tell, give us no need to gather parent plants each year because we could keep these gametophytes growing. You keep them growing uh, as gametophytes and not get fertile for a long time if you keep them under red light or, or without iron. Uh, there's, so there's less hatchery space required because you can, instead of having hundreds or, or even thousands of these spools, you just have a couple of flasks. And we can produce selected strains with this because everything can be done from clones. So in Kodiak, we did some direct sp spraying. Basically, we take a, a gametophyte solution and spray it on these, these ropes here. And uh, you can see in the center picture here, this is these little dots are gametophytes. And this little thing circled here is a, a baby sporophyte, a baby blade. So we don't use strings or pipes. And after spraying these, we put them in the cold room for a couple of hours and then took them out to the ocean, uh, outplanted them, and we got this kite to result here. So uh, it can work, and uh, we need to refine the process more and figure out how to might automate it. But uh, we have a lot of positive feelings about this direct spraying. The other innovation that we are doing is uh, a catenary structure type farm. This has been developed by Cliff Gowdy of Tend Ocean and his colleagues. Basically, the catenary system, which is these catenaries here, uh, is chosen because if the lines are properly measured, uh, then the lines can be very close together with under tension and they won't cross over each other. And like you would have if you had say, individual lines each held by anchors. So this catenary system has got a lot of promise in keeping, uh, in allowing us to grow large amounts of seaweed in a small, smaller space. And the also advantages that you, as shown here on the left, you can put these things together. So it's it's scalable in that sense. Another innovation that we have tried is <clears throat> a special built harvest vessel here called the Harvest Buddy that will pull up this, the lines. You can see the lines coming up here on the left side. It cuts the plants off uh, and drops them into these bags. Uh, here, showing here, the bags are, are um, closed up and they gang together and they float away. And even though these plants are very heavy, these bags float for a long time. So you don't need a special boat here to, to hold all the, the harvest. They can just float away. Uh, not too far, of course. And then the 
Kinder here can come over uh, at leisure, basically, and pick up the bags and take them back to, to port. And the other thing we tried was uh, having a larger vessel harvest. And here's an example of a larger vessel pulling in five lines at once. Uh, it's a turned out to be a basically overwhelming biomass to try to handle. So uh, this last year we we bought, we changed this to one line, and it seems to work a little bit better trying to <clears throat> get things going with that. Our our farm itself is in Kodiak, as I mentioned here, Kodiak there, and here's where the farm site is over in the right, this little area here. Um, Semi-protected, easy access. It was something that was already uh, uh, leased by Nick Mangini. So we had a ready, ready-made farm basically to work to work with. And here's some pictures of the farm over the past few years. Here's uh, our seeding procedure here. You can see the cylinders here with a string going out there. We can seed five lines at once. Here's an overview of the farm itself. Some of the product on the right side here. Uh, this is our farm side in the middle, a couple of pictures on the left. And then on, on the right here, it's a couple of data points showing that on this right-hand side, we show that the best growth of growing these things with experiments, several experiments, we just shows that the best growth is between one and four meters deep. And the picture on the left here shows that the growth at the end of the season for the, in our first year showed that the lines in the middle of the farm were to be were in these areas here, uh, sagged quite a bit. And therefore, the down below this this optimal depth and the lines in the middle or the plants in the middle then uh, grew, grew much, much smaller. So we changed that the next couple of years by adding flotation, which we didn't have the first year. And aside from other problems, we just need to be on the right track and trying to get large amounts in a smaller space. We also do some work with <clears throat> TEA or uh, technical economic analysis. So our TEA person from Woods Hole made some assumptions that this is what would happen if we if this could be done for uh, biofuels, a thousand hectare farm, uh, which is the crop area with ten thousand hectares total farm print because the the scope of the anchors. The farm site's about twenty five kilometers from port and fifty meters of water. We get we're assuming fifteen kilograms per meter wet weight in one hundred eighty days. We use catenary modules, 11,000 kilometers of grow line, 600 different arrays. We use direct seeding instead of using those strings. Six farm vessels at 200 tons payload capacity operating during the harvest. Farm vessels are on site 24 hours a day, seven days, then return for new crew and so on. 44,000 dry tons harvest per year. And so at the end, this is a big spreadsheet figuring out how much everything would cost. But look over here on the right, this tornado diagram shows that the cost depends on, mainly depends on the dry content of the plants, which is about 10%. If you could increase that, then you could uh, increase your, your yield and your profit. Uh, and also just the straight yield kilograms per meter online could all, it would also, if we could increase that, would also decrease the cost quite a bit. But down here at the end here, so it's net income. So we lose money for the first two years. Uh, in terms of capital expense and so on. And then third year, start making a profit for that year and continue to make profit after that if everything is sold, of course. So down at the very bottom here is a is a accumulated cash flow. And we see that we're, we're in the hole for eight years till we finally have a net profit. So with all those assumptions, it still takes eight years to, to make a profit with this sort of sort of very large farm. This would be a large farm on the out, outer off the outer coast. So our hatchery research has potential to radically change the current practices of kelp because we eliminate using fertile plant parents each year, parent plants. It's an alternative seed string, allows for strain selection for desired traits. Uh, our innovative farm design, we think will maximize use of acreage and farm footprints. Harvesting grow lines will be much faster, has potential for automation. Uh, all the stuff that we've done has increased interest in aquatic farm training and aquatic farms in Alaska and transfer of our innovations processors and commercial co-farmers is already happening. So our technology is directly concerned with accessible agriculture of future large-scale farms, especially those 
involved with hanging kelp, such as Sacra and Elyria. And a lot of places are in California, for example, are doing bull kelp and, and uh, giant kelp, which are floating kelps. And the technology we have here may not work with that. Some of our results, such as the hatchery work, will be relevant to all kelp farming. Variations of our farm design are already being used on the East Coast and Alaska. And our project has created a lot of interest in Alaska in seaweed farming and aquatic farming in general. And on the right here shows uh, the uh, number of new permits that are being processed in Alaska. So it's we're getting kind of an exponential rise in, in permits. Of course, this can't keep going because there's only so much land. But up here in the uh, diagram up here uh, shows what we think might be the potential areas offshore for growing uh, seaweeds in Alaska. So we have considerable area and considerable problems, especially uh, uh, areas out here. If uh, climate change hap if happens enough that we this becomes ice free, uh, that has a lot of potential for Alaska. That's, I guess that's good news, sort of. So, so many questions and issues to address for successful farming here. One is we need to know about population gen genetics of all commercially important seaweeds. And this is important in order to not cause uh, harm by mariculture uh, by changing genetic composition of a, of a nearby uh, natural beds. We need to know about diseases of seaweeds and how to treat them. We need to improve that direct seeding process. We need to figure out how to actually move farms to true offshore sites. Right now, we're not there. Um, it'd be good if we could do strain improvements, not allowed in Alaska, but it's other places. But some more important things are gaining social license for all types of mariculture, because that's a big barrier to mariculture in a lot of, lot of, lot of states in the United States. And Product innovation and development is very important because until we have huge farms that can make enough biomass for biofuels, we need to make these smaller farms profitable, and they only can be profitable if they have some type of product they can actually sell, and that also involves marketing. So that's all I have to say right now. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you, Michael, for your presentation. We have uh, about uh, um. Yeah, we still have maybe like uh, people can um, maybe hold on on the question until that uh, second speaker give a presentation. You're right on time. Thank you so much. Okay. Now let's welcome our second speaker, Justin Sternberg, to present. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Grateful for the opportunity to present to you all. Can everybody see that? Yep. Great, thanks. So um, my name is Justin Sternberg. I'm the director of the Alaska Blue Economy Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And I'm gonna be talking about the center's role at the university and our partnerships on uh, with communities and industry partners. And some of the um, tasks that we're doing within the university with our internal partners to address opportunities for Alaska's economy in the ocean and water related sectors. I am not a uh, research scientist. I um, have a background in business in the private sector, uh, initially working in renewable energy and energy efficiency. I've worked in Alaska um, since 1997. And um, I got into the ocean related space in 2014 with um, uh, working with a colleague from my MBA program, Bo Perry, who Michael mentioned in the last slides, um, is the founder of uh, Blue Evolution. And in 2014, we set up a public private partnership with Mike and his lab to um, develop commercial seaweed mariculture in the state, which had never been done before and um, ended up working with the Department of Fish and Game on the permitting protocols, uh, which are largely still in place as they were as um, as we developed them in partnership with the state. And then um, also permitted the first commercial hatcheries and farms, um, one of which, which was with Nick Mangini, who was in the slides um, that Michael showed. 
Subsequent to that, I worked with the Alaska Ocean Cluster, developing entrepreneurship in ocean-related industries, and then joined uh, the university in my current role uh, in the summer of 2021. So the Alaska Blue Economy Center was first stood up in 2019 at the direction of the Office of the Chancellor, Dan White, and uh, included four different units within the university um, that came together recognizing that there was an opportunity for the university to engage further with ocean-based industries and recognizing the value of the ocean and, um, and the river systems to the state's economy. Our mission is to combine UAF's extensive interdisciplinary research, instruction, and public engagement related to Alaska's offshore and inland aquatic resources and ecosystems to serve as a resource to the state and stimulate new external funding in fisheries, mariculture, energy, marine observing, technology, and training. We're located within the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research. And um, recently there was a change where Gwen Holdman, who was previously the founding director of the Alaska Center for Energy and Power, uh, moved over to a new role within that office as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Innovation and Industry Partnerships. Gwen's been building out this ecosystem for some time in addition to uh, setting up ASEP, the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. She also was one of the co-founders of Alaska Center ICE, which stands for Innovation, Commercialization and Entrepreneurship that um, leads um, entrepreneurship activities in the university as well as patents and intellectual property development. And um, so the Alaska Blue Economy Center is, um, is the newest addition. Um, and we came over to the vice chancellor's uh, office um, when Gwen's uh, role was uh, initiated uh, last May. So we partner both internally within the university and externally. And these are some of our external partners in the upper left. Um, our uh, roles within the university in the upper right and um, with both our internal and external partners focused on uh, job creation, commercialization, applied research and extension. Alaska's blue economy is, uh, is already um, quite impressive. We have some of the largest fisheries in the world, more coastline than the rest of the United States combined. We have the largest naturally occurring kelp beds in the world and some of the best uh, kelp growing habitat in the world. Um, this slide outlines some of the existing um, areas that are uh, fully developed um, and go back in some cases hundreds of years. Um, the, the fisheries I mentioned, and we, we recognize seafood processing as being distinct from that. And then coastal tourism is also a huge contributor to the state's economy. Shipbuilding and repair is um, is a smaller component, but shows lots of promise for um, expansion to service the vessels that are in the state. And, um, and then research, of course, as well as um, homeland security and, and military activities are a significant part of um, Alaska's economy, blue economy. Emerging, uh, Michael talked about mariculture. Um, there's also co-product innovations, which is using uh, what would otherwise be waste products from uh, from fish processing um, and other seafood processing to develop value-added products. In some cases, these um, products can be more valuable than the protein from the fish. Uh, there's an increasing need for automation, which was made clear during um, the pandemic. Uh, getting people in and out of Alaska is can be really challenging, especially to very remote locations. And some of the jobs um, that could be automated are actually better done by machines. They're very challenging. There's not enough workers. Typically, the, the, the industry uh, is importing um, workers using H-1B H -1B visas from the Philippines. And, um, and so there's a challenge there and, and a need for automation. Um, vessel efficiency and energy in general for the, for the seafood industry is, um, is critical. Uh, as is the infrastructure that's needed to, um, around the state. Um, there's, very, there's very few ports in Western Alaska, for example, deep water ports. And, um, and another area is data innovations as we're able to go into the ocean 
uh, at much lower cost and with better technologies in ways that we were never able to before we're starting to pull out uh, increasing amounts of large data sets that are requiring data specialists. There's also a, a whole host of nascent industries that are just um, kind of uh, in some cases not even getting started but um, waiting to be started. Traditional ecological knowledge is um, something that's increasingly being recognized through research as an important component of economic development and engagement with Alaska Native communities, recognizing um, the value of, that, of their knowledge and what it can bring and the potential for um, creating economic development in their communities. Bioprospecting, we have some of the largest um, cold water um, ecosystems in the world, then they're largely unexplored or underexplored. Um, and, uh, and then carbon markets, um, skipping down a few there is something that was recently identified that I'll talk about here a little further. One of the primary activities that we're doing is uh, working with industry um, and within the university to map out where the uh, industry's needs are, where their challenges are, what they see as solutions, and then mapping that to the university's specialties. So initially, um, it's often interdisciplinary. Um, I've got the lower two departmental specialties overlapping. In some cases, um, the departments work closely together and other times they're working more in parallel and there's not a lot of communication between uh, the various departments across units. So um, developing those conversations, getting people comfortable with one another and um, understanding how to uh, work collaboratively is part of uh, the, the activities that ABEC is working on. In our gap analysis, um, we're identifying areas where uh, there's um, a need for industry um, expertise that the university doesn't have. I'm going to talk a little bit about that because it's um, there's a process for developing that. Um, you know, it's it's easy for us to uh, partner externally with uh, universities outside of Alaska that have those areas of expertise, and in many cases that's beneficial. There's a lot of um, great partners that we have that are interested in working in Alaska. Um, we don't see ourselves really as competing because Alaska is very unique in the research world, and so there's a lot of interest there. Um, however, there's also instances where there's specialties that um, would be extremely beneficial to develop in state and um, looking at ways to create that within the university system is part of what I'm doing. Um, one of the issues there is that going in and talking with a department um, and, and researchers, um, everybody's extremely busy. So um, even if I come in and present on um, industry needs and the opportunities for uh, work to happen there, most of the researchers are operating at more than 100% capacity, especially with all the uh, research funding that's been made available over the past three or four years. Um, and so um, there's a challenge to get people's attention at the, at the staff and faculty level. Uh, and what the best practice there is to actually start with the students and engaging with the students. That can begin with community engagement. Um, and this can happen as early as um, middle school or high school. There's a, there's a grant that we're working on that's funded by the Office of Naval Research where we're setting up community innovation hubs in both Cordova and Kotzebue. This is run by the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. It's primarily focused on renewable energy in those communities. And it's really about uh, letting the communities drive the conversation rather than coming in as outsiders and suggesting what they should do. We, we do our best to listen to them and engage with them and provide them uh, research tools that will facilitate them finding solutions for their energy needs. We also recognize that energy isn't the end goal. There's a there's a economic output piece on the other end of um, developing uh, cheap renewable energy. And the difference can be pretty staggering um, from some of the lowest costs in the country for electrical power all the way up to some of the highest costs based on whether or not there's renewable resources in these communities that have been developed. 
Um, so that community engagement piece is really key. key. Part of the goal is in the community innovation hubs is to bring students into the university and um, simultaneously uh, educating them on, on in areas where uh, the community has identified that there's challenges and preparing the community to hire the students back um, after their um, education uh, so that they can continue to work in their communities and address uh, an ongoing issue in Alaska, which is brain drain. Uh, where uh, students that receive a higher degree education have a difficult time coming back in, and working in their communities. Um, experiential learning is another uh, key piece here. And currently it's happening kind of ad hoc at the, at the class level or, or the um, individual um, professor level. Um, there's uh, some effort to identify ways to expand that and to coordinate further with interested parties, industry partners that have projects that they would like to bring into specific classes. And uh, a best practice there is to also maintain um, some degree of facilitation within the process so that you can ensure that the students are meeting the industry's needs and that the industry is also um, providing enough time for the students to, to get them the information they need. That can evolve into summer internships as well as fellowships and eventually graduate work uh, partnered with industry partners and then ideally leading to employment with those um, same partners. These are areas where uh, where there's touch points that we can engage with students in this process to get them excited about the ocean. Um, and for the coastal communities in Alaska, pretty much all the communities in Alaska, including those that are inland are actually, um, they're also on river systems. So uh, almost every, um, uh, every uh, population center in Alaska has uh, some tie to the blue economy. And these are areas where we have opportunities to engage with the students and um, bring them into um, bring them make them aware of the opportunities in the blue economy and how that relates to them and uh, we've seen a lot of excitement they're building um, and so for instance with our community innovation hub partners we're developing a mariculture curriculum that could be taught at the high school level and um, engage students um, while they're in high school so addressing those gaps to meet industry needs once once we get the um, uh, once we have the students on board, it's easier to bring uh, their teachers uh, into the fold and um, and that uh, in turn engages industry and administration as well. Then setting up an academic industry um, stakeholder work group would be the next step to talk about ways to develop critical areas within the university, uh, identifying funding for those areas, which could start as simple as just providing some electives. Um, I'll talk about, uh, mention ocean engineering in a bit here, but um, some early discussions about including some electives within mechanical engineering as a starting point for um, creating that field uh, of expertise at, at UAF. And then of course, strategic planning. Um, and sometimes that's very agile. Like when the case of the Alaska Blue Economy Center, we're building the airplane as we're flying it, so to speak. And so it can happen on the fly um, as necessary to be more responsive. A couple examples here um, where this is taking place, underwater gliders is an area that shows tremendous promise for um, delivering better information from within the ocean. Uh, there's significant innovation and expertise at U at the University of Alaska Fairbanks in these areas that are and it's spread across um, multiple disciplines and multiple units. Um, in many cases, they're sort of collaborating, um, but there's opportunities, I think, for alignment and developing a broader Alaska statewide initiative and going after funding. There's four key areas of development. Oceanography is uh, primarily where it's focused right now. There's also the launching and maintenance of the drones and, um, and the data platform that I referenced earlier um, in regards to the increasing amount of large data sets that are becoming available, uh, essentially exponential, uh, exponentially growing amounts of data. Um, for instance, uh, one of the glider fleets, um, the UAF Oceans Lab um, within the College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences uh, has uh, a single glider that's um, looking at fisheries issues 
and um, working with partners and industry partners to uh, identify opportunities for real-time quota management using the gliders, uh, but they believe that they need um, an order of magnitude more gliders going from one to at least 10 in order to get a level of data saturation where it would have the predictive qualities that would be necessary for um, uh, industry's needs. There's also ocean engineering innovation that happens both on the sensors and the gliders themselves. And as I mentioned, that's an area that we don't currently have at the university. Another example is the development of Alaska's carbon market and the potential for monetizing ecosystem services, essentially putting the uh, vast, uh, relatively intact ecosystems in Alaska on its balance sheet. Uh, this past, uh, or this January, um, Governor Dunleavy introduced uh, the carbon management and monetization bills that would set up a framework for govern governance of a um, Alaska-based carbon market. And there is incredible opportunities uh, in the direct capture, um, both from our um, export of, uh, of energy resources, but he also identified seaweed mariculture as um, a primary uh, opportunity given the amounts of uh, carbon sequestration that are involved uh, when you get to seaweed mariculture at scale. There's extensive research expertise related to climate in this regard, but we have little direct experience among researchers um, it, with carbon markets. So in the future, you could imagine um, like a certificate based on like life cycle analysis or uh, monitoring measurement and verification, um, two key components for developing carbon expertise. There's my contact info if uh, anybody needs it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for uh, just uh, Michael and Justin for uh, take, uh, taking time off your busy schedules to give us this opportunity to present uh, the blue economy and the uh, mariculture of uh, sugar cap um, in the Alaska. Uh, also, um, we'd like to thank for Michael because um, he actually is calling from Tasmania, <laughs> Australia. It's like 5 a.m. in the morning. So let's, uh, I, I thought, um, I checked there's a couple of questions uh, to Mike. You want to address them? Because I see that uh, you have some uh, change with um, a few people on this uh, chat. So you can just um, mm. you know, <clears throat> give some response here. <laughs> I, I answered them in the chat if you yeah, want to read it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, if but, anybody, uh, yeah, sorry. Well, there was an issue about mariculture effect on water chemistry, and it's something that we just don't know enough about, it, especially um, if we have very, very large farms, there could be some effect. I mean, after all, the seaweeds are are uh, competing with phytoplankton for the nutrients. Uh, another issue that I mentioned with carbon sequestration by dropping seaweeds to the bottom of the ocean, seaweeds not only break, take carbon down there, but they're also taking nutrients down there. So I'm... I'm a long way from being convinced that seaweeds is going to be an answer to uh, carbon sequestration. Yeah, let me see if uh, we have any new questions here. Yeah, there's a, a chat a question on Justin. Justin, could you talk more about um, how you do the industry uh, gap analysis. Is that something you do through interviews, more informal connection building, a structured analysis or some other process? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's definitely an example of um, building the airplane as we're flying it. Um, there's, we can point to how it happened at the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. Um, there's some good examples there um, that are relatively analogous, um, but it essentially starts working with uh, researchers and, and building a team based on um, folks that have areas of expertise. And for instance, in the mariculture space, uh, we, have, uh, we have one researcher um, uh, named Sherry Umanzor in the College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences, uh, who's focused specifically on mariculture. But then there's also um, a geneticist at CFOS as well, Jessica Glass. There's um, some um, some researchers focused on um, on ocean acidification, 
and uh, and then there's uh, like a pathologist um, in the veterinary school uh, that um, also is interested in looking at um, pathology uh, for seaweeds. And so building out some of those, um, building out a team is essentially the first rule. People that have skill sets that are relevant and identifying where they are uh, within the university. UAF isn't a huge university, but uh, every day I learn something new about it. There's an incredible amount of um, different things happening there. And, um, and so uh, it takes some time and it takes networking. I think the next step is to formalize um, you know, we've also been doing the same thing. We've been reaching out to industry partners, uh, folks that we've already been working with in some cases for many years, but um, it's pretty broad. So uh, identifying um, fisheries, mariculture, and seafood processing, I think are our top uh, three priorities, uh, at least initially. And then bringing together in like a, a work group of industry partners and researchers to start to address and and look at where the industry's priorities overlap with the university's um, research skills, and um, and then within that it's really about conversations within the administration, talking with like um, in the ocean engineering example, talking with the Dean of the College of Engineering and Mines to see um, if he has the bandwidth to take something like this on. Turns out he's also bringing on an aerospace engineering program currently. So um, there's not a lot of bandwidth there, but he also recognizes the opportunity and thinks that there's potential for a stepwise approach. Um, so you can bring in um, pieces of that. Some of that actually happened when the Alaska Blue Economy Center was first set up. Um, they concurrently created a Blue MBA program with the College of Business and Security Management, which is our business school. And so that's now getting up and running. It's the only Blue MBA in the world that can be done asynchronously. And um, and I think the only other one that I'm aware of is, uh, is in Rhode Island. Um, which was also uh, interestingly set up by the Dean Brad Moran of the uh, College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences. So he's now set up two, uh, or been involved in the creation of two. And um, and so that kind of, it, it, it's an interesting approach. There's, there's I, I would almost call it, you know, there's a lot of interest, the almost pressure from the state to um, do more engagement um, at the community and industry level. There's a lot of needs in the state um, climate change is impacting coastal communities very significantly. So um, I think people recognize um, the challenge and the opportunities there. And there's a lot of willingness to work together. And you see that definitely in the mariculture space where it's very collaborative. Um, there's obviously some competition, but it, it tends to be more friendly. Um, and there's a lot of people being attracted to the space, um, both from within the state and from without. Okay, Great, thank thanks you. very much. Yeah, thanks. Um, any other questions from audience? Okay, I, I saw um, I, Wilbert has a, with uh, your hand, so <clears throat> please go on. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, really great, great presentations, uh, Justin and Michael. Um, so my God, what, what do, in your vision are the, the main barriers to really upscaling um, the kelp farming to really big scales? Is that kind of, is the market a limiting factor there or is it mostly uh, technology? It's, uh, it would be both, I'm sure. But uh, in order to make larger farms, you're going to have to have um, some markets that lead to larger scale farms. Of course, and I don't know what those will be, but people work. Bioplastics is one of the things that people are talking about for for doing that. And then, you know, we haven't actually tried putting structures on the outer coast, and I think that could be a big a big challenge to us. And we haven't done that yet. And <clears throat> do we need something like at the scale of oil, you know, oil derricks that are out there, or or can we do something that's that's a lot cheaper and still effective? We don't know yet. People are working on it a little bit, uh, but that's still a long, long ways to go, I think. Great, thanks. Just a follow-up question for, for Justin. Um, so 
I mean, if if kelp farmers could get carbon credits for for this, right? Um, it, then it would help to, to offset some of the, the costs, I suppose, and uh, maybe uncertainty in the in the in the market. Um, okay, I know that that's something that you're thinking about a lot, and you, you mentioned that in your presentation too. I was wondering if you could um, could talk a little bit about that. What what would be needed to add um, kelp farming to the the, the global carbon carbon market? Yeah, it's well right now. Ninety nine percent of the carbon credits are land based. Um, but in talking with experts in the carbon field, they seem to think that that's actually the inverse of what it should be, that there would be far higher quality uh, carbon credits coming out of the ocean that would be more impactful to addressing climate change more immediately. And um, nobody, to my knowledge, has ever developed a carbon credit based on seaweed. So understanding that um, what that looks like would be a, a good first step. And um, you know, I think I don't know that it would ever be a primary source of revenue, but it could certainly help on the margins where uh, you may have some, you know, farmers may have seaweed that's left over that they don't have a buyer for, or there may be parts of the seaweed of the kelp that uh, don't go into the processing, um, and um, that they could use for carbon credits. And and one of the things that yeah, one of the markets. Um, for, for seaweeds would be as um, as uh, animal feed. And so there's it looks very promising from a methane reduction um, perspective with uh, some studies showing uh, as between 20 and 80 percent uh, reduction in methane from um, animals that are fed uh, a diet that includes uh, seaweed and also a corresponding reduction in the amount of food that they need to eat because they're getting better nutrients of about 10%. Um, so that may, may, you know, with the relationship between carbon and methane being what it is, you know, it's many times um, uh, more credit uh, for methane uh, due to its impact, it may be a better market to go after um, methane equivalent carbon credits um, than to think about sinking the seaweeds, um, at least initially. I know in Canada, it's like uh, methane emission from animals um, is uh, about, from farm animals, it's about 25% of their total greenhouse gas emission. So it's pretty significant. And 80% um, seems really high, but if you figure, you know, these studies, depending on the species, it's somewhere in there, it's still, it's still a fairly significant amount of methane that could be reduced quickly. Great, thanks. Very, very interesting perspectives. Yeah, any other questions? Or, um, Bieber, do you have any other announcement? No, I don't think we have any other announcements. Um, okay. Still deciding on the, the next meeting, so. <laughs> Okay, uh, if we don't have any other questions, I, uh, I would like to thank all those speakers Mike and Justin for uh, taking time out um, from your busy schedules to, to um, give us a really excellent, um, great presentations. And I also want to thank our participants to join um, our meetings. We hopefully will see you sometime in the future. It'd be Thank great. You. Thanks so much. Thank Fair. you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks all. Bye-bye.